A focal length from a bygone era. There was a time when 135s were the standard telephoto option. And if you find an old kit in your travels, there's a great chance that a 135 of some type will be in there. Well, you can still find 105s, 180s, 200s galore as you begin exploring vintage telephotos. Nothing gives quite the same punch of speed, size, and reach as this magic focal length. And with a few relatively simple designs out there, some have speculated that there are no bad 135s. Is that true? We're going to take a look at a few to see. Some $5 pickups from flea markets and thrift stores. Some relatively coveted lenses like the Nikkor 135 2.8 AIS and the Pentax Super Tacmar 2.5. Does it really make a difference? Well, before we find out, let's figure out why do I like this focal range so much? Well, there are a few reasons. First, these lenses are small, they have good reach, and they're usually sharp. You can also get great focal with them. It fits right between the short and long range of the popular 70 to 200 zooms that folks love. They're great lenses for background blur and to separate the subject from the background. The 135 focal length equates to 200 millimeters if you put it on an APS-C camera. So, it gives you two different classic focal lengths for the price of one. And it provides a classic head and shoulders or headshot look. They're plentiful, lots of choices available to play with, and some versions have many bladed apertures, as you may have seen in one of my previous videos. I've used a lot of these, including a few exotic and hard to find versions. If you come across a close focus Vivitar or anything faster than 2.8, give it a shot. You won't be disappointed. But by and large, there are very few downsides to using any of these. My biggest issue is they typically don't focus close. You usually need four or five feet between your lens and the subject, which can make using these in a day-to-day -day situation a bit of an issue. When you find one that does close, focus closely, though, that's a great keeper. As with all older lenses, not all are, are coated perfectly, and you can experience some flare and some aberrations. As is the case, if you find any cheap vintage lens, look for the condition. Is it tough to focus? Is the aperture frozen? Do you see some fungus or any haze? Otherwise, I think the toughest thing about vintage 135s really comes down to one thing, and that's figuring out which one you want to throw in your bag. Here's what I care about in a 135. First, how's the micro contrast? Will there be a sparkle in the subject's eyes under the right conditions? Second, how close can they focus? Can you get that close-up shot or not? Third, how's the bokeh? And finally, fourth, if using a telephoto for landscape, how does it hold up even in the corners? Now, let's look at some comparisons. scene here. This is going to be a, a test of the lenses in a landscape. So first one we're looking at here is the Minolta 3.5 shot wide open at 3.5 and I'm going to do a little comparison here. Um, I'm going to t keep it at 3.5 on the left and push it up to f8 on the right. And what you're going to first see is uh, just kind of testing this lens out big difference between the amount of aberration, chromatic aberration, uh, wide open in 3.5 compared to uh, f8. So the lens is still a pretty good lens. Some aberration, again, you can see it in the branches. Still pretty darn um, sharp here. Even in the extreme corner, you can still make out those shingles, but a little bit better on, on the right-hand side when we stop it down to f8. Um, I'm going to compare that lens now on the left here, the Minolta 3.5 wide open, 
And I'm going to now compare it to the Minolta 2.8 Celtic, also wide open. So let's take a look and see the difference. So the Celtic's a little bit larger lens. Um, as you can see, it's it's pretty sharp too. Um, even though it's shot at 2.8 compared to 3.5, I think it's pretty close in sharpness, but you can see the contrast is better on the Celtic here. And you can see a little bit more detail. So even at 2.8, because it really does a good job correcting that chromatic aberration, um, I think it's pretty much almost as good, even in the corners here, as the 3.5 is. 3.5 is no slouch, though. Looking into the trees again, I think the uh, the, the Celtic may be just a, a touch better here. Now let's come. So let's keep the Celtic here. I'm going to put it um, 2.8 on the left and f/8 on the right, and you can really now start to see that that Minolta Celtic 2.8 is a very very sharp lens. Even in the corners is here. Um, once you stop it down to f8, you can really see quite a bit. At f16, real major difference in depth of field. Here we can see this little flasher, perfectly sharp, as well as the, the extreme distance, extremely sharp. This Minolta 2.8 at 2.8 here on the left side. I'm going to consider that sort of our winner so far. And on the right hand side, I want to take a look at some of the other lenses wide open. Schneider lens at f4, that's as wide as it goes. So you can see even though it's f4, more aberration than the Minolta at 2.8. Um, you can see a big difference in corner sharpness. Even wide open, that Minolta is really, really good. Even if we stop the Schneider down to f8, it's still not quite as sharp as the Minolta is wide open. And uh, still aberration, right? Now on the right, I'm going to take a look at the Vorn, which is a Spiritone 2.8. This is a T-mount Spiritone, lots of blades, um, probably made by Sankar. Talking a nice lens that's that's nice for portraits, a um, little glowy, has a lot of uh, um, flare going on, single coated. Still a pretty sharp lens. You know, even in the corners you can make out some detail, but definitely being impacted, not so much by chromatic aberration, but by lens flare in general. Here it is wide open. Here it is. Even if we get it into f8, um, still not as contrasty, a little bit sharper, but not as contrasty as the Minolta at f2.8. Now let's compare, uh, there's a Chinar 2.8, which is also a pretty interesting little lens compared to the Minolta 2.8. Both of these are again at 2.8. Kind of looking at them, the China are a little bit glowy here, wide open, a little bit of aberration, a little bit of flare, a little bit softer, a little less contrasty. You can see the aberration in the twigs on the tree branches. You can see in the extreme corners, though, still pretty sharp. Not a bad lens. And in fact, if you stop it down to f8, that uh, auto China becomes a really nice little sharp lens and a cheap one at that. Here's an interesting one. It's a Colt Pro. I think these are very similar to the Vivitar 135 2.8s that were made by Kino. Again, you can see it does not control aberration. Very similar to the Chinar. Pretty sharp in the corner. Maybe not quite as sharp at 2.8. Right? By F8, really sharpens up quite a bit. Get a little more depth of field and uh, looks pretty good. At that point, it beats the Minolta. But if we look at the Minolta at f8, it's a little bit of a different contest. 
you know, very, very close. Minolta may be a little warmer. That China R may be a little bit more, I'm sorry, that Pro may be a little bit more contrasty. Nice lens once it's stopped down. I'm going to keep the Minolta at f2.8. Let's take a look at this Acura. 2.8 is not even close, not nearly as sharp a lens in the center more aberration in the corners major major difference in that Acura if we stop it down to f8 again it's about as good as a Minolta is at 2.8 maybe slightly better but it's it's pretty darn close so if you're shooting and you're planning to do landscapes and you're okay with shooting uh, stuff wide open you know you can definitely get away with it but the Minolta much better wide open. Oh, an interesting lens. This is the Pentax uh, 135 f3.5. Very compact lens. Zooming in. It's a sharp lens. Not as much contrast, but it is um, pretty sharp. You could see some good. You could see the braiding here in the lamp post. You know, wide open. You can see that there is quite a bit of chromatic aberration on the Pentax side very visible here on the roof. If we stop the Pentax down to F8, that totally goes away and it's considerably sharper than the Minolta at F8. If we bring them both in at F8, you can still see the Pentax still edges it out. So once you're getting past that wide open stretch, Pentax is a real nice little lens there. I'm going to take a look at the Pentax again. This is wide open. This is the Pentax here on the right um, at f8. And you can see a real big difference there in the corners, in the center. Stopping down does a lot to that lens. I'm going to go back to the Minolta again. Again at 2.8 wide open. And on the right hand side, I'm going to compare the next lens we've got which is the Pentax 2.5 wide open, Super Tacomar 2.5. To my eye, the 2.5, again, was glowy, a lot of aberration, a little bit of flare, um, sharp lens, maybe not quite as sharp as the Minolta wide open. Stop it down to F8, just like the um, 3.5 Pentax, very, very sharp lens. I don't think it could quite compete with the Minolta wide open, but it can certainly compete with the Minolta at f8. Here are both of them at f8. Very, very close. Minolta really does a good job of controlling that aberration, though. Again, left side, the Minolta 2.8. Right side, I'm going to pull in the Nikon f2.8 f AIS lens. This is probably the strongest lens I have. Um, I always consider this my best lens. You can see in the center, it is a little bit sharper than that Minolta wide open. It does have more chromatic aberration wide open, but you can just see a lot of really good detail here on the Nikkor side. Really good colors, really good contrast. Um, going into the corners, um, this is the extreme corner, really sharp. So the Nikkor is definitely the winner, wide open. Stop down to F8, the chromatic aberration goes away. Um, I'm going to compare the Minolta here at F8 to the Nikkor at F8, apples to apples comparison. Um, the Nikkor is still really, really sharp. Definitely the winner. So, I guess the question though is, how important is that on a landscape shot? You know, these details are very, very minor. These are very, very close, these lenses. But again, a little bit more micro contrast here on the Nikon side. Just a real, real good solid lens. We're going to look at these lenses shooting wide open and one stop down and this is my favorite use of a 135 lens and the first one up is what i think is going to be the strongest 
This is the NICOR AIS-135. This is uh, that lens wide open. And what I love about it is if we zoom into the eyes, they have that special sparkle. And call it contrast or micro contrast, call it. But there's that special thing that you get in some lenses. And even wide open, this Nikon has it. So you can see Lily, my daughter's eyes look great here, zoomed in, they have all that contrast. Um, you can see the background is fairly uh, well blurred out. You can see the bokeh balls um, fairly roundish, some of them a little football-y, but uh, overall, this is exactly what I look for when I'm looking for a portrait, head and shoulders, and that Nikkor lens really does deliver. Here it is, um, same lens, stop down to f4. You can see the bokeh bubbles change, right, uh, into their octagons. And in fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just do a side-by-side -side comparison here so that you can see um, wide open here on the left and at f4 here on the right. Now, let's look at the next lens. We're going to compare wide open. So again, Nikon on the left, and this time I'm going to look at the Pentax 2.5 on the right. So these are my two most expensive lenses, right? If we zoom in, we can see the Nikkor really nice eyes, really, really uh, sharp. The Pentax, not quite as much. Uh, Pentax, a little bit smoother blur and an interesting transition, but doesn't have that super sharp um, uh, view on the eyes that uh, I personally love. If we get down to, again, I'll go back to the Nikkor here on the left side, Pentax on the right. If we stop the Pentax down and get it to um, F4, then we're getting pretty close. You're starting to get that awesome micro contrast around the eyes. But I still don't think, even at f4, that this lens is quite as sharp as the Nikon. Um, on to the next lens, which is the smaller Pentax, the Pentax 3.5. And here that one is. And what's amazing is you can really see um, on the 3.5 compared to the uh, Nikon wide open that the Pentax 3.5 now we're starting to get that really, really sharp look, even wide open, um, which is really interesting, really what I go for. So I like this Pentax 3.5. It's small, very compact, lightweight, and look, wide open. Boom, you're getting some really good stuff with the eyes. Maybe not quite as good as the uh, Nikon, but it's it's at least in the ballpark. You have really nice bokeh balls. Uh, I think the background is nice and smooth. And so I really like this uh, Pentax. Uh, stop down, uh, the Pentax, really sharp, right? As sharp as the Nikon, uh, in my opinion. Um, really good stop down. But again, now you're getting the, those F4 uh, straight bokeh balls, not quite as, as beautiful in the blurred background. Now let's compare it to the Minolta. So again, Nikon here on the left at 2.8, still wide open. Let's look at the Minolta 3.5 wide open. And if we zoom in, we will see, you know, it's trying, but it's just not quite there. It's not quite at that same level as the uh, wide open Nikon. You know, it's okay. The bokeh is kind of nice. It got rounded here, bokeh bubbles and that sort of stuff. If we stop it down, um, you're getting really close again. And what I like about that Minolta 3.5 is, number one, it's so small. And number two, look at the bokeh balls even stop down to around 5.6. You can get a nice sharp image in the center. Um, not quite the amazing representation of the Nikon, but pretty close. And really nice bokeh balls even stop down. Now, for another one of my favorite lenses, um, this is the Vorn. It's a Spirotone uh, 2.8, old, old lens, not great coatings, um, single coated, um, 
but gives you that nice vintage look, as you can see. Compare this lens here on the right, this Vorn Spirotone, uh, to the Nikkor night and day difference. This one's nice and soft. The bokeh is very, very uh, lovely, um, not nearly as harsh. That's what you're buying that lens for. And if we zoom in here, you can see that even though the contrast isn't that great on this Vorn, the detail is there. So if you wanted to, you could do a lot of a little bit of work onto this um, image and really get at least as good as the Nikon and still have some really great bokeh, which is why even though it was a $15 lens, I still keep this Vorn around. And then look at this. Here's that Vorn stopped down to F4. Um, and here's what you get. You get really nice bokeh up at the top. You, know, you get some onion rings up there. Um, and it's really, really, um, really cool that it's stopped down. And guess what? That bokeh, because it has 17 blades, stays nice and round and beautiful no matter how far you stop it down. And, you know, look and see. You get really sharp detail um, in this Vorn lens, even though it's a little bit more, um, uh, what, uh, not quite as, as cr contrasty. But you could definitely fix that in post or keep it like this to have a nice vintage look. So that Vorn, very interesting lens. Now let's look at the Minolta 2.8. And I struggled with this one because, uh, again, all of these shots are straight out of camera. Um, they're raw images, no changes made to them whatsoever. Um, I wonder if maybe I missed focus on this Minolta a little bit, or is it just simply not there in terms of um, of the sharpness at small focal distances. If, you, if we, when we look at this lens on the landscape, it was an amazing performer. But in the portraits, I don't know. You have these football bokeh here as toward the edges a little bit. Um, it's a little bit rushed. Um, not quite loving it. Uh, if we stop down, you know, it gets it gets sharp again. I wonder if I missed focus maybe slightly on it. Hard to say. Um, maybe I did, um, but again, um, not quite as good as the Nikkor here on the left-hand side. Moving on, this wide open at f2.8 is the Pro, and uh, I've been saying that this lens, I believe, is the same as a uh, Vivitar 135 2.8 made by uh, Kino, and. It is a. Uh, it impressed me out on the landscape, and guess what? If I zoom in, it impresses me here too. This is probably the second sharpest lens, almost as sharp, wide open, in the middle as the Nikon. Um, you know, look at those eyes. This is what I'm looking for. This is the same ballpark as the Nikon, and this lens here was like five bucks, and the Nikon was, you know, a two hundred dollar lens. Um, so. Really, really cool. I don't know that the bokeh is quite as as uh, refined as you would see on the Nikon side, but a really, really nice lens option if you're looking uh, to find something that looks great in portraits, uh, gives you a nice sharp rendering. Uh, here at f/4, you know, you can see once it uh, pops in, also pretty close. Um, you know, nice looking rendering there. So the next one was one that uh, didn't perform that well in landscape. And uh, I'm going to say I am a little disappointed. It really didn't perform that well on the portrait either. And that's the Acura. Um, similar to the Vorn, it, it has like sort of a washed out look a little bit, maybe a little bit of flare, not really controlled really well, which kind of gives you an interesting vintage look, but it just doesn't have the, the same contrast. Uh, that the Vorn did. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, click on the Vorn here on the left-hand side so you can see um, compared to the Acura, right? They're both kind of washed out, but the Vorn is really, really, uh, really tight and looks and looks uh, uh, really sharp on the inside. It's just an interesting rendering. Going back to the Nikkor here, our, our, our favorite, I don't think there is even... Um, I don't think there's any, it's not even close there. And the bokeh here on the Acura also very, I don't know, not so great. These footballs here and, and, and a little bit distracting. Um, as you stop it down, 
it does get a little bit sharper, but it's still not there. Nowhere near as sharp as the Nikar, even wide open. Uh, another lens that did pretty well in the landscape was this Chinar. And if we look at this um, here and on the portrait, it's not too bad, but not quite uh, as sharp as we would like it to be. Um, you know, not nearly as sharp as the Nikon. You could really see a difference. Here's a $200 lens on the left side and, you know, $5, $20, something like that lens on the right. Um, not quite there. The bokeh is not terrible, but, um, you know, not quite the same rendering. What's interesting is at F4, this Chinar definitely gets sharp. Um, still not quite as sharp as the, uh, as the Nikkor, but uh, I hate the bokeh balls here. This is that weird, like kind of Chinese star looking um, bokeh balls from the aperture that, that looks almost like a saw or something there. So I point that out. And then last, I'm going to show the Schneider. Uh, and what's interesting here is that here's a big difference between minimal focal distance and these two lenses and how important minimal focal distance is, right? Uh, the Schneider's not terrible. It's not you know, a, a horrible, um, you know, uh, uh, not sharp rendering here or anything like that. Here it is at F4. You know, it's it's not that it's not sharp. It's just, you know, what a difference in the portraits between here on the left and here on the right, even if we get down to, to wide open, right? Um, just so much more depth of field on the Schneider side, which, you know, is probably not something you're looking for in a portrait. And uh, the bokeh just is not nearly as smooth uh, as you would see on some of the others. So that is my uh, rundown of the portraits. Uh, again, I would probably go Nikkor wide open without question. Um, clearly the, the strongest contender. Um, I think that the Pentax uh, F2s are all right, but the F3.5 wide open is a really nice lens. Um, I would probably go there as my second favorite, especially considering it's so small. Um, surprise of the day was this, were two big surprises, the Vorn at 2.8, um, even though it looks washed out, a lot of detail, pretty darn sharp lens uh, with a very nice vintage look. And then the Pro um, at f2.8, really, really nice lens. I think almost comparable to the Nikkor in terms of sharpness wide open. In the end, none of these were able to defeat the Nikkor AIS lens. It flat out wins, at least to me, in virtually every measure. It's among the smallest, smooth to operate. It's the sharpest lens, even wide open in both landscape and portrait situations. It even focuses closest of any of these. And as a wide open shooter, it's still the best lens I own at this length, and I can't see letting it go, even if it is a bit pricey. Super Tacmar 3.5 is a stellar performer, and it's my number two. It's great even wide open, and it's smaller and lighter than the 2.5. It has the same wonderful, buttery feel, and if you've got a bit of light, it's great for portraits. Stop down, it's a serviceable landscape lens too. The Vorn or Spiritone is a real specialty lens. Like we saw when I looked at it with the other T-mount mini blade lenses in the other video, it's sharper than it has any right to be. It's smooth to operate. It's not as contrasty as modern lenses, but it keeps that cool bokeh no matter how much you stop it down. It's, if you're looking for a vintage portrait look, this one can be the right choice for you. The Pentax Super Tacomar 2.5 is smooth as butter and built like a dream. Performance was pretty good, but I don't think it's worth the premium price, especially when considered the 3.5 version, which we also reviewed. The Pro was a big surprise. It was great in both the landscape and portraits. Sharp, contrasty, and it is among the best of all the cheap no-name brand lenses I've ever used. It's really a gem. Minolta Celtic was a super performer on landscape, clean and sharp from corner to corner, even wide open. It does a great job controlling chromatic aberration. I just don't love it in the portraits. The smaller Minolta wasn't bad, especially stopped down a bit. 
if you've got plenty of light, it's a small lens that does a great job in both landscape and portrait if it's stopped down a little bit. It's tiny and can fit in pretty much anyone's bag. The Chinon, at least to me, is a very usable lens. Stopped down, it's a pretty nice performer. And wide open, it gives that decent vintage look. Acura gives an interesting vintage look, but it's the worst performer compared to the others. Is it usable? Well, that's really up to you. The worst lens of the bunch, at least to me, was the Schneider. It looks cool, and it's pretty wild for its age, coming in the smallest size, but the focal distance is just a killer. It may have been good for on the rangefinder that it came on, but it's just not a great lens adapted. So, should you have a 135? Of course! Current generation 135s like the Canon 135 F2L or the Nikkor soft focus equivalents, well, they're older designs but still cost over $500. Brand new Sony E-mounts would be over 1000 and you'll spend hundreds more on manual focus versions of current lenses uh, from Zeiss. Anything inexpensive that you find out there, probably based on similar designs to vintage lenses anyway, aren't that much better. Clearly, whether you can afford one of the best in class or just want to pick up a cheap option, there's no reason why you can't have a 135 in your kit. Throw it on your camera with an inexpensive adapter and go out there and take some awe-inspiring 